Good morning, and welcome to this worship service brought to you from St. Matthew Lutheran Church in York, Pennsylvania. We welcome all of you who are joining us for worship this day via Facebook Live at STMATTYORKPA or via the live radio broadcast of this service on WYK 1350 AM, Sports Radio 98.9 FM, the 98.9 WYK.com website, and the new WYK app. We welcome all of you as we gather today. I want to thank those who sponsored today's radio broadcast. To the glory of God and in loving memory of Horace B. and Mary E. Fink Eisenhower, sponsored by their family. Also, in loving memory of our parents, Janet and Harvey Laux, this is sponsored by their children, Sue Hawksworth, Harvey Laux II, and Jane Laux. And we thank these persons for their sponsorships today. Present to help us in leading worship today are Eric Riley, our artist in residence, our pastor for faith formation and discipleship, Pastor Keith Fair, our director of community outreach, LeQuinn Thompson, who is handling the video live streaming, Chris Grove, who is assisting with the radio broadcast, and I am Kevin Shively, the lead pastor here at St. Matthew. Please remember that the St. Matthew Church building continues to be closed, but the office is open Monday through Friday, 8 to 4. If you need to stop by, please call ahead or email so that we know you are coming. And also, please remember you need to be wearing a face mask or other covering when you come into the building. The Safe Ministry Task Force will meet again this week via Zoom. And this group continues to investigate and research the latest information and directives from local and state health department officials, as well as surveying other congregations and church authorities around uh, our situation here and how best to proceed. Among other things, this group, when it meets today, will evaluate today's outdoor worship service, which went very well, and we hope to present another one very, very soon. Please continue to look for updated information via the website, Facebook page, and our print communications, including the weekly broadcaster. A letter was distributed to the congregation this past week via eBlast, Facebook, and the website, and that letter will also be on the broadcaster cover next weekend. In the meantime, Sunday worship continues here at 11 a.m. on the radio and Facebook Live, and also Wednesday evenings, Compline Night Prayer on Facebook at 8.30 p.m. On the St. Matthew website, you can find daily devotions, Bible readings, past sermons, faith formation resources, links to our YouTube channel and Facebook page where you can find past worship services, weekly Bible studies, and songs around the campfire where congregational members uh, share songs in a fun setting. You'll also find on the website links to join email lists and receive announcements and up-to-date information. And you will also find there multiple ways to make a financial offering to the church, text, uh, electronic giving, and the like. And please do know the pandemic has hit the church budget very, very hard, and we need the support of everyone as you are able. Please know how very much we appreciate that. Again, today's worship will include the digital celebration of Holy Communion. And again, participation is entirely your own choice, but if you plan on joining in receiving the sacrament later, I invite you to prepare now by gathering together some bread and wine or grape juice. Today's worship will also include a children's message offered in the midst of the sermon and a reminder that the prayer and hope cross remains in front of the church on Market Street throughout this month of August. Please take some time to stop by some at, at your convenience to reflect and pray and remember and pray for our country and society during these difficult times. Also, we are reminded to gather personally and privately on a daily basis for prayer at 3.17 p.m. We will continue now with the confession and forgiveness. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, whose steadfast love is everlasting, whose faithfulness endures from generation to generation. Amen. Trusting in the mercy of God, let us confess our sin. Reconciling God, we confess that we do not trust your abundance and we deny your presence in our lives. We place our hope in ourselves and rely on our own efforts. 
We fail to believe that you provide enough for all. We abuse your good creation for our own benefit. We fear difference and do not welcome others as you have welcomed us. We sin in thought, word, and deed. By your grace, forgive us. Through your love, renew us. And in your spirit, lead us so that we may live and serve you in newness of life. Amen. Beloved of God, by the radical abundance of divine mercy, we have peace with God through Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained grace upon grace. Our sins are forgiven. Let us now live in hope, for hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Jesus gave his mandate, share the good news that he came to save us and set us free. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling through the Lord inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Let none be forgotten throughout the world in the triune name of God go and baptize listen listen God is calling through the word inviting offering forgiveness comfort and joy listen listen God is calling through the word inviting offering forgiveness comfort and joy help us to be faithful standing steadfast walking in your precepts led by your word listen listen god is calling through the word inviting offering forgiveness comfort and joy listen Listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. From God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace be with you all and also with you. Let us pray. O God, our defender, storms rage around and within us, and cause us to be afraid. Rescue your people from despair. Deliver your sons and daughters from fear and preserve us in the faith of your son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. First reading comes from the book of Romans. Moses writes concerning the righteousness that comes from the law, that the person who does these things will live by them. But the righteousness that comes from faith says, do not say in your heart, who will ascend into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down, or who will descend into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. But what does it say? The word is near you, on your lips and in your heart, that is, the word of faith that we proclaim. Because if you confess with your lips that Jesus is Lord 
and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For one believes with the heart and so is justified, and one confesses with the mouth and so is saved. The scripture says, no one who believes in him will be put to shame. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. The same Lord is Lord of all and is generous to all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? And how are they to believe in one in whom they have never heard? And how are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? And how are they to proclaim him unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the 14th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. Jesus then made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead to the other side, while he dismissed the crowds. And after he had dismissed the crowds, he went up on the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. But by this time, the boat, battered by the waves, was far from the land for the wind was against them. And early in the morning he came walking toward them on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified, saying, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them and said, Take heart, it is I. Do not be afraid. Peter answered him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you in the water. He said, Come. So Peter got out of the boat, started walking on the water, and came toward Jesus. But when he noticed the strong wind, he became frightened, and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him, saying to him, You of little faith, why did you doubt? When they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. So, since right after Pentecost, we've been working our way through the Gospel of Matthew. And in particular, it's actually taken us five weeks just to get through chapters 13 and 14. Now, that's not simply because our reading pace has been slow, it's also because of the careful crafting that Matthew has wrought throughout the story. Matthew is the consummate rabbi with more connections to the Old Testament than all three of the other gospel writers put together. And one of those connections is the structure of Matthew's narrative itself. Matthew's Gospel contains five pairs of discourse and narrative, that is, passages of teaching and parables followed by passages of plot and action about where Jesus is and what he does while he's there. And people who study these things say that Matthew probably intentionally created these five sections to mirror the first five books of the Old Testament. The five books of Moses, what we also know as the Pentateuch or the Torah. Each of these sections of discourse occurs on a mountaintop, symbolic of 
being in close proximity to God. And each one ends with some variation on the phrase, after Jesus finished saying these things, dot, dot, dot. Now we're in the narrative that follows the third discourse. And as I said, we've been immersed in these two chapters for five weeks. And it's been a busy five weeks weeks for us and for our hero. Events have been moving so quickly that the pace and the pressures have been taking a very human toll on Jesus. He has been rejected out of hand in his hometown of Nazareth. He has learned of the gruesome execution of his cousin, John the Baptist. And after he hears that particular piece of tragic news, Jesus attempts to go off by himself for a while. But the crowds continue to press in on him, people begging him to heal them and the, their loved ones. So instead of having time to rest and to grieve, Jesus spends yet another day expending more energy, caring for their needs rather than his own. And by evening on that day, even his disciples sense that Jesus is becoming haggard. They encourage him to send the crowds away so that they can get something to eat. But Jesus won't hear them. He says, no, don't send them away. You give them something to eat. So at the end of this exhausting day, on top of everything else that has already happened, 5,000 men, along with women and children who are uncounted. So what, we're talking 15,000, 20,000 people, more? This many are fed miraculously with just a handful of loaves of bread and two fish. All of this while Jesus is dangling at the end of his strength. Jesus, the Son of God, has infinite creative power at his disposal. But Jesus, the son of Mary, is exhausted. Physically, emotionally, mentally, he is spent. I'd like to take just a moment to talk directly to our kids. Some of you may have heard of these two big words that I want to share with you, introversion and extroversion, or introverts and extroverts. Now, sometimes people will say that extroverts like people and introverts don't like people, but that's really not true. I'm an introvert, and yet I couldn't do this job. I wouldn't even want this job if I didn't love people. There are lots of differences between extroverts and introverts, but I'll highlight just a couple of them. One, for extroverts, being with people gets them excited. For introverts, being with people makes them tired. It doesn't have to do with whether they like people or not. It just expends their energy. Second, extroverts, you will never have to guess what they're thinking you're gonna know in just a few seconds, maybe even finding out at the same time that they do. Introverts, you may not find out what they're thinking until after the conversation has already ended, when they've had time to think about it a little bit more and process it and then come back and say it. As I said, I'm an introvert. My family loves to tease me that one of my favorite activities when I was a child was being in a closet by myself usually playing with socks. I don't know why. I can't remember everything I did with these socks. I don't know if I was like arranging them on the floor by size and color. I don't know if I was like pressing them out flat and folding them. I, maybe I was putting them on playing hand puppets. I have no idea. But that's the, that's the family story, that Keith liked hiding in the closet and playing with socks. Now, a lot of you, all of you, have been living in a pandemic for the last six months or more, right? How many of you have been finding that you're arguing with your family a little more than usual? 
Well, there's a reason for that. You can't get away from them. And they can't get away from you. I know that, you know, depending on how old you are, maybe you're never really alone, that there's always someone in the house with you. But we're so used to the rhythms of at least, you know, mom and dad maybe going off to work, you going off to school, and having that space away from each other for a little while. Whether you're truly alone or not, at least the scenery would change and the people that you are with would change. But now you guys are together nonstop. And it's hard. We're not seeing our friends and other family the way we'd like to. We're not, you know, I know people that really would like to go away to work. I know kids that would like to go back to school. And even in a few weeks, when, when, when you do return to school, many of you won't actually be returning to school. So I just encourage us all to give each other some grace and be patient with one another and try to find that time to have some space to ourselves to be quiet for each other. Because the next thing that we know about Jesus is that he's putting the disciples into a boat and sending them off across the lake. They don't even have a choice. Jesus makes them get into the boat, it says. And he says that he's going to meet up with them on the other side. And then he dismisses the crowds of people who are now healed and filled and whole, everything that Jesus himself isn't. And then he goes up on the mountain alone and finally has time to pray and to grieve and to rest and recover. All of that takes us through the first two verses of this reading. Meanwhile, out on the Sea of Galilee, the disciples are having a really hard time. They have been rowing into a headwind. Now, this isn't like the storm that they encountered back in chapter 8, the one where Jesus was asleep in the back of the boat, and they woke him up, pleading with him, Lord, save us, do you not care that we are perishing? Now, this is one of those windstorms that so frequently blow through this region of the world, even to this day. They spring up quickly, they last anywhere from a few minutes to several hours, and they die away almost instantly. No rain, no lightning and thunder, just wind. And if you're on open water, waves. Now these disciples, they're experienced sailors, many of them. They're probably not afraid of this storm, but I'll bet they're exhausted. In Greek, it says that Jesus came to them during the fourth watch of the night, which would be somewhere between 3 o'clock and 6 o'clock in the morning. They have been battling this headwind all night long. They've got to be beat. But what gets them scared is Jesus coming to them, walking on the water, winding his way in through those waves. Now, they're terrified. They think he's a ghost. Remember, these men are Hebrews. To them, water is a symbol of chaos, especially when it's kicked up into choppy waves by a strong wind. They probably thought that this phantasm coming toward them was evil incarnate, ready to drag them down into Hades. But Jesus senses their terror. Take heart, he says. It is I. Do not fear. He says that last thing a lot in Matthew and in the other Gospels, do not fear. And the it is I in Greek is simply I am, which would be an echo of God's divine name. And, and then comes Peter's famous extracurricular, extravehicular activity. A lot of times I have heard this, and maybe you have too, heard this passage lifted up as an example of faith. Peter steps out of the boat and is able to walk on water like the Son of God himself. 
until he loses his focus and he becomes afraid of his surroundings and he drops his eyes and he starts to sink. And then he cries out for Jesus to save him, which of course the all-powerful Jesus does, gently chiding him for doubting and leading him back to the safety of the boat like a precocious toddler being put back into the playpen. And as far as that interpretation goes, that's fine. But I have a hard time believing that that's why Matthew continued, contains this story in his gospel. Remember, Matthew already has one story of Jesus calming a storm. And while Mark and John also both contain the story of Jesus walking on water, only Matthew goes to the extent of sharing this bit about Peter attempting to do the same. So first off, there's the way that Peter calls Jesus out. If it is you, Jesus heard similar challenges during his temptation in the wilderness. If you are the Son of God, Satan says to him, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Jesus is going to hear these words of challenge again from the high priest at his trial and from the bystanders that mock him as he's hanging on the cross. None of this is really great company to lump Peter in with. On the other hand, this is the only case where Jesus acquiesces to the request for proof of his identity. Peter says, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. All right, Jesus says, if you insist, come on out. Now, when a man whose name literally translates to rock, steps out of a boat and not onto a pier, you can bet it's not going to go well. And indeed it doesn't. But Peter does serve as a positive example of how to respond in faith when overwhelmed by circumstances. When he cries out, Lord, save me. And Jesus does. But instead of holding on to Peter's hand and promenading with him around the waves, he leads him back to the boat, where both Peter and Jesus get in with the rest of the disciples. And that's when the wind dissipates. That's when the waves settle. And that's when the disciples proclaim Truly, you are the Son of God. At the end of that first Jesus calming a storm story back in chapter 8, the disciples are left muttering to themselves, Who is this then that even the wind and the waves obey him? Now, six chapters later, they answer their own question. Here's another question. Why did Jesus have the disciples get into the boat and set out across the lake in the first place? Sure, he needed the time alone, but that's not the only reason. Why did Jesus cross the lake? To get to the other side. Because when he gets there, he is immediately recognized by people, again, and crowds gather around him, bringing in people who are sick and possessed that he can lay hands on them and bless them and make them well. Because that's what Jesus does. And that's what happens everywhere he goes. And that's what he's now able to do, having had that time apart. I think this passage actually has a lot to say to us about the power of self-care in the face of emotional stress and mental and physical exhaustion. I think it also says something about the power of community and shared experience. Jesus brought Peter back to the boat, and he got in with him. 
Last week, I, I read something by the Reverend Dr. Mitzi J. Smith. She teaches New Testament at Columbia Theological Seminary in Decatur, Georgia. She writes this, Sometimes we are haunted by visions of our better selves. Our better selves are such an improbability for us that to see it, to envision it, and what it may take to achieve our better selves is a haunting. We are haunted by better days that seem to escape us. There is so much going on in our world right now. So much upheaval and controversy, so many people oppressed and misrepresented, so many others sick and dying. So much demonization of anyone on the other side of a statement or a stance. But Jesus reminds us that we are all in the same boat and that he is here with us. And that our better selves are within reach like, like phantasms walking toward us on the waves, beckoning. We are in the boat, all of us together, not just because there's comfort and safety in community, but because we are going somewhere together. We are on a mission to reach out to those around us who feel left alone on the sea, who are abandoned without protection from the wind and the waves, who are hurting and hungry, who are lost and alone, who are looking for a cause, a companion, a leader, a savior. We have been sent to embrace them with the unconditional love and grace of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Let us join in confessing our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Confident of your care and helped by the Holy Spirit, we now pray for the church, the world, and all who are in need. Gracious and loving God, we pray for your whole church throughout the world. Give courage in the midst of storms so that we see Jesus approaching despite the wind and waves and hear him calling to us today in words of comfort. Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. We pray for the well-being of your creation. Protect waterways, forests, lands, and wildlife from exploitation and abuse. Help the human family endeavor to sustain and be sustained by the resources of your hand. Watch over lives and habitats and communities disrupted and destroyed by Hurricane Isaias in the Caribbean and along our eastern seaboard. Use your people to bring relief and hope. We pray for those places in our world devastated by hardship and heartache, especially the people of Beirut, Lebanon, where a tragic accidental explosion at the city's port has killed more than 150 people, injured over 6,000, and left more than a quarter of a million people homeless. We pray for our global community near and far still fighting the coronavirus pandemic. We remember that in you steadfast love and faithfulness meet and righteousness and peace kiss. May nations in conflict know the peace that is the fruit of justice. 
And may our leaders know that your compassion and wisdom always seek the common good. We pray for our own community of faith. Accompany all who are lonely. Hear the voices of any who cry out and support those who are insecure in their housing, employment, and well-being. We pray for those suffering this day, especially Doris Grimm, David Rupert, Stephen Klein, and Pastor Pat Snyder. We ask your protection and grace for students and teachers preparing for a new school year that will not look anything at all like what they are used to. And we rejoice at the marriage of Margaret Falkimer and Matthew Leonard and ask your blessings upon them and their families as they enjoin this next step in their lives together. O oh God, we give you thanks for the saints of the whole church from all times and places and for the certainty that nothing can separate us from your love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always and also with you.
Let us pray. God of goodness and growth, all creation is yours, and your faithfulness is as firm as the heavens. Water and word, wine and bread, these are signs of your abundant grace. Nourish us through these gifts that we may proclaim your steadfast love in our communities and in the world. Through Jesus Christ, our strength and our song. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. ever-loving, ever-living, ever-sustaining God. Blessed are you for creation when your breath swept over the waters and brought forth life from chaos. Blessed are you for accompanying your people throughout the ages. Blessed are you for extending your protection, your shelter, your peace, your discipline, your forgiveness, and your grace. In this time when we are physically separated from one another, we trust in your spirit to connect us to each other and to you. As we lift before you this bread and wine, we know that you are near to us, binding all your people into one. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread. He gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Take and eat, this is the body of Christ given for you. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Take and drink. This is the blood of Christ shed for you. With this eating and drinking, we remember his birth and teaching, his punishment and death, his resurrection and ascension. We remember who we are, broken in body and spirit, but renewed and reunited in Christ's love and sacrifice. Send your spirit upon all who share this holy meal, that we may rest assured in your promises and teach us to pray in the words of our Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen.
Let us pray. God of the welcome table, in this meal we have feasted on your goodness and have been united by your presence among us. Empower us to go forth, sustained by these gifts, so that we may share your neighborly love with all. Through Jesus Christ, the giver of abundant life. Amen. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. God the Creator, Jesus the Christ, and the Holy Spirit the Comforter, bless us and keep us in eternal love. Amen. <clears throat> Go in peace. Christ is with us. Thanks be to God.